Uh, hello. Um, I'm going to try recording a complete, because I'm kind of crazy. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is uh, Josh Rodman, Jay Rodman. Um, and I'm going to try recording a complete uh, playthrough of Bard's Tale through 3, because um, some people on YouTube were interested in it, uh, and I was trying to sort of goad someone into um, recording their playthroughs of other games with uh, more commentary and more information so I could kind of appreciate them playing the other games. So I thought I would give it a try myself, you know, learn as I went. Um, so, I'm going to try playing Bard's Tale on the Commodore 64. I'm playing it in Vice. Uh, here's the old uh, Commodore boot screen. Uh, the Commodore, you uh, di didn't boot off of disk. If you put a disk in, it didn't load the disk, uh, and there wasn't really an operating system or anything, so you typed in these weird basic commands to start games. So I've put in the boot disk, and I'm typing the um, startup command. And um, I'm going to just this time let it run normally. Uh, Commodore had a famously slow uh, floppy disk drive, and um, it, is, it, is, it is slowly reading the disk. Oh, let me dra 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 drag this into the view. So this is a, 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 a satellite control for Vice, which is an emulator. And you can see it. Oh, never mind. So here's the intro screen. I will I will shut up for a bit. So that's the intro loop. Um, we have a bard playing by a campfire, singing about how the world has been sort of not exactly destroyed, but um, put through the ringer. Uh, the the this is the third game of the Bard's Tale series. Uh, in Bard's Tale One, there was an evil mage and made Eternal Winter, and you defeated him and freed the town of Eternal Winter. And Barzell 2, there was another evil mage, because, you know, whatever. And you went through a long quest, it's complicated, and of course, the feet of the day, both kind of like small beginnings, there's a threat, the threat is defeated, the people are saved. The framing here is different. Um, you're... You've kind of... Everyone's kind of already lost. Um, the world has already been screwed up. You're back at the first town from the first game, Scarabre, which has already been destroyed. There was like a flame, a sort of uh, firestorm that burned the whole town more or less to the ground. Uh, there were a bunch of standard mechanics in the game. There's a, there was a, or sorry, kind of, not standard mechanics, um, familiar characters. Uh, there was a place where you bought and sold equipment, Garth. And he ran equipment shops, and you bought stuff and sold stuff uh, at his shops through both games. There was a place where you could pay to have your magic points restored. Um, uh, there were many inns, etc. Here, there's no Garths, because Garth is dead. There's no Roscoe, because Roscoe is dead. Uh, 
most of the townspeople you might have ever encountered, most of the town, all the people are dead. The Mad God has already wreaked his wrath over everything. There's no adventurer's guild where you create your posse. There's instead a refugee camp. Um, the framing is sort of it's like the apocalypse this isn't post-apocalypse like the future nuclear war this is apocalypse like the big bad enemy that in most fantasy games you would be trying to prevent from doing these things has already done these things um, and you're trying to maybe put the pieces back together a bit I found this I mean it's not like a big change to the fantasy formula but I enjoyed it quite a bit as a change of pace Anyway, so uh, this emulator features uh, uh, a speed changing thing. I can make it run at a high speed, so I'm going to be skipping most of the load times. Uh, and I'm going to play from scratch um, because, uh, well, I don't have all year to do this, and also because the. Um, uh, Bard's Tale 2 on the Commodore 64, I'm playing on the Commodore 64 here, has uh, some really severe bugs that make it like uh, very unpleasant to play through. Um, now, uh, also there's the funny thing, which is the the Amiga and Atari, sorry, and Apple II GS, and to some extent the PC, had kind of better graphics in Bard's Tale 1 and 2, according to most people. Um, there's some charm to the 8-bit, the Apple II, non-GS, and Commodore versions, but um, generally they were considered to look worse. But somehow, because in Bart's Tale 3, um, Electronic Arts uh, built the um, fancy computer versions on their own, they did a kind of terrible job and made bad graphics and screwed up the game mechanics and made all kinds of problems. Meanwhile, the 8-bit versions, they had really mastered those platforms, so they look kind of better than the better computers. Anyway, so here we are in um, the ruins slash the refugee camp. I guess it's called both. And the first thing I'm going to do is this save disk came with someone else's um, characters. So I'm going to destroy them entirely, because I don't want them. Oh, I guess I thought they were someone's characters. There was a save game, uh, but I guess they were the built-in ones. But in any event, I don't, I don't want to start with them. I'm going to start from scratch. Uh, some people might... So I'm deleting them. Some people might um, take their equipment to uh, get a slightly easier start. Another clone, I think, is probably not part of the initial game state. Okay, so uh, in this game, we have um, uh, up to seven slots in the party. In Bart's Tale 1, you had six slots and a special slot for summoning something. In Bart's Tale 7, sorry, Bart's Tale 2, there were seven slots, one through seven, like this. And in many dungeons, you needed to include, needed to uh, find something in the dungeon and invite it into your party for typically puzzle reasons. Um, so it's almost as if the game expects you to play with six with one free and use a summon and replace it as needed. Uh, although I played with seven characters except for those times where I needed to put in someone in my party. Uh, and in this game, there is basic, there are people that are sort of story-ish that you could bring into your party, but there's actually no requirement that you do so. And while it might seem satisfying to go with the minor story elements and bring them into your party, I choose not to do so because all of the summoned and uh, invited and NPC uh, characters that you can acquire in all of these games are incredibly weak compared to a party of yours that's reasonable. Um, so they always feel kind of 
annoying in that they have terrible armor class and they're always getting hit and they're always dying and they don't do any damage. So I'm going to play without any NPC characters. Uh, entirely seven characters of mine. Now the game system uh, has the first four characters can be hit uh, in combat by hand-to-hand -hand attacks and the last three can only be hit by uh, ranged attacks or spells. So my planned end game for these seven slots is to um, have three casters in the back and four hand-to-hand -hand people in the front. Uh, let me start by creating... This is the Bard's Tales. So I'm going to create a bard. And for no particular reason, except that it speeds up uh, image load times, I'm going to make all my party members women. So we're going to have a female elf bard, and this is a um, ancient... Actually, I guess it's a ha I'm going to make a half elf. This is an ancient RPG, so well, ancient by modern sinners, and um, female half elf. Uh, so we we re-roll until we get what we want. Now, for my bard, their stats are not super important. Uh, constitution is good for not dying because it gives you extra hit points. Um, she will be fighting initially, so strength is of some value. Uh, but in a way, the eventual most important stat of a bard is luck, just so they don't get hit by spells as much. That increases their saving throws. So um, I basically am wanting to get for my bard. Uh, I don't actually want to have a character I don't know its stats are. Um, High-ish luck score. And a... Not six. A highest luck score. A 13 I probably should have kept. And the decent constitution are my most important stats. This may not be the optimal race for this. So if this isn't working out, I may switch races. Because races kind of don't really matter past the initial stats in this game. Um, in the original Bard's Tale, because D&D was so prevalent, stats maxed out at 18. Because, you know, you rolled three... Because you rolled three uh, six-sided dice, and you went out three th to 18 stat range. And 18s were the godly stat. So... Uh, in that game, 18 was the maximum, and you gained one point when you leveled up in one random stat. Sometimes the one you wanted, sometimes not the one you wanted. In this game, for some reason, um, stats go higher, I think to 50? So, uh, getting a high value in what you want initially can be of significant value um, when you're, especially, like, for constitution, which increases your hit points every time you level up, or IQ, which might include your increase your um, spell points every time you level up. This this value seems good enough to me. The luck is above average. Constitution is slightly above average. Hit points are high. This will be my bard. Uh, I will call her Chantrell. I don't know why. Okay. Um, now, bards are pretty useful because they can play songs, which are long-lasting magic effects. And they can also play the songs in combat, and it's fairly easy to get items where they can use an infinite number of them, so they can just keep on using a certain number of relatively, uh, relatively limited spell effects. Um, but pretty essential is that they lower your armor class with one of those long-lasting effects, and armor class is pretty essential to staying alive early. Um, I'm also going to make a whole bunch of fighters. Um, I don't think I will keep them all. I think I will shift the party, probably more warriors and paladins early, maybe dropping one later to make room for more spellcasters. I'm going with a half orc because uh, I want constitution and strength more than anything. That looks good. Uh, 17 constitution, 18 strength. This will be a... Um, I think this is a warrior. My half-orc warrior. And this will be... I don't know. Uh, 
Grisnock. A a a fine warrior name in the orcish tradition. Uh we now need I don't know if um paladins I'm making a dwarf for some reason because I think they have if I remember correctly they have slightly better uh constitutions than most of the races. That seems that's terrible, terrible luck. That's too terrible of a luck for me. That's even worse. Um, oh, look at that 19 strength. I suppose it isn't really that important to have optimal stats. Uh, especially because, well, in this in this uh version of Bard's Tale, oh, I'm gonna accept that even though it has terrible luck, and I'm just gonna put up with it because 19 strength and 17 constitution is um, fine by me. So this is going to be a paladin seven, and I don't know, she'll be lady um uh book shield. I don't know. Um, pardon me. Uh, so I now have. Let's just add them. I have. Oh, I have to press. That's right. The key. The, the cursor keys on the Commodore were so strange. There was um, an up down key and a left right key, and you had to press shift to go the other way. And so uh, so the the way that the map in Vice is honest to the positioning, and it's, so it's kind of weird. Uh, that I the down doesn't like work. Anyway, we have three hand hand people. Uh I need at least a fourth. Um in the PC version and Amiga versions, uh a lot of the instant death weapons, the critical hit weapons, don't work. So people tend to value hunters very highly. But we're playing the Commodore version where they do work, and therefore hunters who have critical hits that take a long time to learn on, I don't, I don't really want. Uh, I'm gonna make a monk, I think, because they eventually do a lot of damage, and then when a lot of damage isn't enough, they at least don't have to carry much, so you can, they can, they can hoard a lot of treasure, uh, which is nice. You can make fewer. You can make fewer trips to managing your inventory. Uh, again, should I put up with this terrible luck? I'm going to put up with it just because 19 strength. Uh, falling beer. No. Uh, uh, I don't know. What's a monk name? A monk dwarf. Uh... I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Um, Zin... Uh, strong in the arm? So I'm just going to go with that. Okay, add... And you can rename them later, so if I hate these names, or uh, I can I can stop. Um, okay, I need a rogue. This is this game is titled "The Thief of Fate." It's not they're not joking. Uh, you don't need the thief to start out with, but I think by the time you finish the starter dungeon, you do need you pretty much need a thief to beat the starter dungeon boss. And um, there is a boss towards the end of the game where no one has that I know of has figured out an alternate way to beat it. Um, also, um, the thieves are much more useful in this game as compared to earlier Bard's Tale iterations. Here I'm looking for high dexterity and constitution. Dexterity 18. Oop, I, it's so easy to hit escape on this terrible Mac keyboard. 
Uh, in Bard's Tale 1, Thieves, Rogues, well, Bard's Tale 1 and 2, Rogues are pretty much pointless. Uh, there's a, what they offered is the ability to disarm traps, and there's a very cheap spell that also disarms traps, and if you have a lot of mages, like say you place your rogue with a thief, sorry, your r rogue with a mage, then the mage can disarm the traps as well as the rogue can, and cast lots of powerful attacks. Uh... I kind of want a slightly better constitution. Is that better enough? You know, 18 hit points? Is that high or low for this? This is low. Uh, I'll take it. Sold. Uh, Belladonna. Why not? She's a hobbit after all. And although in the text she was... I, oh, I'm thinking of the Sackville Bagginses. Whatever. It's a name. Uh, now we need... Well, I mean, we don't need, but uh, we will eventually need at least two... Well, you need at least one mage, because someone will have to become a chronomancer. Um, we'll find out more about that later. And... Um, can't imagine getting through this game without an archmage. Uh, I think you tech you sort of can't because there are spells where you have to defeat them by casting. Sp there are puzzles you have to solve by casting spells, and pretty sure you need an archmage um, to do that. Personally, I want to have two archmages by the end of the game. Probably by the time I start adventuring beyond this realm. Um, so, anyway, we're going to start off with two casters. Uh, so, we're going to create two casters. The good caster um, races tend to be gnomes and elves. Gnomes have the highest intellect, if I remember, but they have such terrible hit points, which can be a problem starting out. Uh, it becomes much less of a problem later, because casters can change classes, and when you change classes, you gain a whole bunch more levels quickly, and you get a bunch of hit points, and it's a little odd, but that's just how the game works. This is me trying to make a high IQ elf, and being kind of stymied. 15 is not really, it's not really exciting me. 16 is better, but look at that shitty luck. Pardon my French. Uh, maybe I'll take this one. Okay, so this is gonna be a uh, conjurer three. There's four kinds. There's oh, there's lots of in the original part stuff. There's four kinds of mages. In this, there's lots. Uh, this is my elf who will be called um, Gon Gondolinolin. Uh, that might be sort of male sounding, but whatever. Oh, it's I misspelled. Let's can I rename? Uh, remove them all, and then you can rename, I think. Rename. How about Scala Dalla Lin? I don't know. I'm gonna just be cheesy. Okay. Um, we need one more caster. I'm gonna go with a gnome this time. A gnome with an IQ of 14 is not impressive. 17 is better. Look at those terrible constitution scores they have, though. Just abysmal. IQ 17, constitution 10. Taking this one. Last one I made a conjurer, I think better have been, because now I'm making a magician. She's a gnome. Um, we're going to call her Stubby. Okay, so here's my party. They're probably not in order yet. So first... Okay, uh, and how do we reorder them? 
Oh, N for new order. Uh, maybe the warrior followed by the paladin uh, followed by my bard and then my rogue with the monk in the back because they start out with terrible armor class. So you can see I have armor class 3, 3, 3, 4, 7, 9. Even though my monk will be doing nothing but sitting around collecting experience points, we will probably die less. Okay, and now we're going to save the party. Um, I don't know. Uh, the... Noobs. Okay, the party, the name of the party is just w you can load them under. So if you uh, have no one loaded, you say add member, and instead of picking them all one at a time, you can just pick the name and they all load. Okay, so a nice touch as compared to earlier Bard's Tales is when you create. Uh, party members. This is Grisnok you can see on the left here. Um, they come with equipment. This is a list of equipment and the fact that there's that weird backwards E on the left means that it's equipped. I don't think it's really meant to be a backwards E, but whatever. And if you press enter, unequip, you can see this is what it looks like unequipped. This is like equipped. Uh, so for example, if I unequip the scale armor, her armor class goes down to 7. But again, back down to three. This is old D and D rules, so lower armor classes are better. Uh, your m worst armor class possible, I think, is ten, just like advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, there it is, ten. And as you uh, wear better armor, it goes down and down and. This game has a lower boundary, but it is not zero, it is minus 50. Uh, it's unclear to me whether the game tracks armor values if they go below minus 50, like does it really go down to minus 89 or whatever and just not show it, or is it really capped out at minus 50? I don't really know. Um, we don't have that problem right now. So um, we're going to... We've done everything we need to. We have a party, they're equipped. We can't even buy equipment in this game. You, you can only find it. Uh, or maybe do a quest for it. Uh, in later sessions, I'll probably try to show a map, or some subset of a map of what I'm up to, but I'm just getting started here. Um, this is the refugee camp where we just were. And Here's what sort of remains of normal. Si oh, they have a fight. First, first I have to kill a viper. Vipers are, I think, a little hard for a first level party, so we'll see how this goes. Um, I actually don't know what I'm doing. Do I have anything usable? No. So I'm gonna just attack, attack. Um, my bard will sing. Sanctuary score in the hopes of lowering my armor class so that we don't die quite as much. My rogue is going to try to hide in shadows. No, I think hiding in shadows will mostly fail at this point. I didn't look at their abilities, but I'm just going to attack, defend, and I'm going to cast spells because I don't really know if we're going to win. Oh, I kind of expected there to be a menu like on the uh, DOS and Amiga versions, but there's not. Um, if I remember correctly, she, she Tenuvial is the type of mage that can cast arc fire. The way you cast spells in this game is you type in a four letter code, uh you look them up in the manual. Arc fire is a direct damage and verbal plating, which is like a, a a combat buff is the other basic spell, which I'm gonna cast on Grisnak. And let's see how this goes. So there's my bard song and all the armors went down by one. The Viper successfully hit me, which I don't much like. 
Um, uh, we're hitting them. We killed that viper. The spells were pointless. Okay, so here's to the north refugee camp. We're turning e east and moving over. Here's the other little bit of civilization, Scrapwood Tavern. I assume it's sort of put together from bits of other buildings that were blown apart. Uh, you can buy um, booze for your bard. Your bard is powered by alcohol. In fact, um, if I leave the tavern and bring up my bard, we can pass the inventory screen. For each character, there's a special screen. Number of tunes left, zero. So uh, I'm going to go back in and order a drink for her. Order three. She'll try some ale, and she'll have it here. And she'll buy... S Oop. Not, not her. No one else needs... I mean, you can buy alcohol for other people, but there's really not much point. I'll have some wine to go. Uh, there's a little bit of complexity about the inventory system in the way that there was not in the earlier games. So like, if I press enter on this wine skin, I see stuff like... The normal thing is I can trade it, I can discard it, I can equip it. It also tells me it's filled with spirits. So... Um, uh, containers can be full, can have different kinds of fluid in them. Uh, here's my other characters and their special abilities just for fun. So here's a warrior who I think has actually no special abilities, so it doesn't show me a third screen. Um, here's my paladin who may also not have a third screen. Paladins can use different equipment and have better saving throws. They're otherwise essentially warriors. Uh, the bard we just looked at, they can play a number of tunes. Uh, a rogue has a number of special abilities, so here's my percentage chances of success. We can 7% of the time do a bunch of different things. Identify chests, disarm traps, identify items. Identifying items is the only way. Some items come to you unidentified, and in the older games you could sell them, and the merchant would would identify them then, or you could just pay the merchant to identify it. Here, it's the rogue or nothing. Maybe you get a spell much later. I can't remember. Um, uh, hiding in shadows is the main trick. Once rogues get good at it for combat, they hide in shadows and then stab people. Um, I don't know what critical hit. I don't know how critical hit works. If that's just your normal attack, sometimes crits. Uh, probably should know. Don't know. Uh, here's our monk. I think monks have no special screen. The main thing that monks do is they do more and more damage without using weapons, and their armor class goes down and down without using armor. Um, my conjurer on the third screen, it will show a list of spells. So I can cast Mage Flame, which is a illumination spell, Arc Fire, a direct damage spell, and Trap Zap, the cancel trap spell. You can use it on chests, or just in front of you. The three squares in front of you, if they have traps, they get removed. Um, and my other caster, the Magician, has Vorpal Plating, which is the combat buff. Lasts for the combat. Quick Fix, which is a heal, which I should use right now. And Scry Sight, which is, um, tells you where you're located, uh, in a dungeon or not in a dungeon. I guess I can't cast it by pressing enter on it, but I can say cast seven, quick quick fix. Who's injured? Uh, Chantrell. And is no longer injured. All healed. Uh, let's show. Cast. Come on. I must have fumbled. Scry sight. So this says we are one south and two east of the refugee camp. So our sort of point of origin is the refugee camp and wherever we are in the wilderness will be told how far away from we are from it, it, the game will tell me how far I am away from it whenever I cast Grisite 
which is a fairly inexpensive spell. Um, you can adjust the speed that this scrolls. I made it go a little faster because I'm, I don't feel threatened in these fights. Um, I have, at this point in the game, I have a few goals. My primary goal is to... Oh, this, this enemy is 20 feet away. One Wind Diver, 20 feet away. So if I try to attack it, uh, my attacks will miss unless it comes closer. So here I'm missing, and it casts a spell, but it can't hit me from there. So I'm sort of assuming it's going to eventually decide to come closer where it can, spells can work. Attack, 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 event, event, event. I was saying, OK, you can step forward. Step forward and die, please, Wind Diver. If it does not, I will just... Okay, fine, I'll step forward myself. I may get hurt. It's no big deal. Well, whatever spell it cast, it wasn't on me. It might have, like, improved its armor class or something. Or healed itself. Or made my armor class worse, except I can see it's not worse. Oh, we all hit it, and it didn't die. Okay, so this is the shape of getting started in this game. Uh, you probably will would want to um, explore the wilderness a little bit and see what's out there and uh, work towards leveling up, which is one of my, which is really my main goal, is to get enough experience points to gain a level. Oh, and of course, there's the um, promise of perhaps finding better equipment. So far no one's dropped anything, which is unfortunate. So so right now my experience is 487. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone needs about 2,000 to level up. In the wilderness, one, one of the things that's fairly easy to find is this walled structure. Um, and that turns out to be... Oh wow, 9 points of damage. That is not... That is not nice. The puma seems to be harder than some other things that I can encounter in the wilderness. Maybe I should run. In fact, I'm going to try to run. When you run, you don't always get away. So that was me not getting away. It doesn't really give you a lot of feedback on not getting away. Uh, let me cast some spells. Lo the most important thing is healing Belladonna. Because dying is depressing and expensive. Oh, one hit point short. We're going to do some more healing. So my, my stubby is going to cast Quick Fix on Chantrell and again on Belladonna. That's enough healing for now. Uh, if you go in this divot on the boxy town, uh, you're supposed to be entering the town and it loads a oh there's this nice text among the ruins of Scarabray is an unnatural silence as if death itself has come to stay so this is the bombed out destroyed town that um, you rescued in Barstow 1 and well to little avail as now it is destroyed 
you, you, it's sort of the same layout, but greatly reduced. They didn't keep all the complexity of the original town because, well, there wouldn't be a lot of point. And they saved on space. But this is a definite um, location you would probably recognize if you played the original. This is the Grand Plaza, the uh, big open square in the middle of the town. And here we find a statue to the Mar Mad Guard Tarjan being all clean and shiny in the midst of the ruins. And over here is the Temple of the Mad God, where they ask for you to speak to the priest. Um, in Bard's Tale 1, uh, the Mad God's Temple was the second dungeon, and you had to determine the name of the Mad God in order to, spoilers, get in. Uh, but it's not too unobvious in this game because everyone's talking about the Mad God and naming him all the time, so I sort of can't avoid spoiling that one. This is the old man. The, in Bard's Tale 1 and 2, there were review boards where when you had enough experience points, you would go here and check to see that you are ready for advancement, and then they would level you up. You didn't level up on your own out in the field. And you might remember where it was, because it's in the same location, uh, but the only one left here is this one old man. There's the, the you know all of the guild leaders are no longer present. Um, you know the people appraising your skills they've been killed. Uh, there's just this one old guy left. He's the only non mad god follower left in town. So here's his introduction. The old man in the review board scratches his head. Yes, you are the prophesied ones, but you have come too early. No matter. Beneath Scarabray, you will find one of Tarjan's devotees. Brilhasti Aptarj is a foul necromancer, and his life impedes my efforts to stave off disaster. You may enter the catacombs under the mad god's temple by uttering his master's name, Tarjan. Destroy Brilhasti Aptarj, then return to me for your true quest. With a wave of his hand, the old man re-energizes all magic users. Uh, for some reason, I guess maybe expedience, when you complete a quest or start a quest, I guess it was the same in this game, uh, you return to the old man to kind of check in and say, I did, did the thing you wanted, and he sends you on the next thing. He always gives you all of your spell points back, which is kind of nice, since there's no easy way to refresh them. Um automatically otherwise. So I kind of came here to see how many more experience points I would need on my different characters. I think everyone needs 2,000. Uh, no, my mage spellcasters need only 1,800 uh, for whatever reason. Um, so that is the general shape of this game and I'm going to end it here um, and then begin grinding.